Dr. Licata is the founder and director of the Laboratory of Cardiovascular Science at the NIA, and he also has adjunct appointments in the physiology departments at the University of Maryland and, uh, Johns, and in the cardiology division at Johns Hopkins University. He received his MD magna cum laude from Georgetown University, and then he went to Rochester, New York, where he did his internship and residency. After that, he spent two years uh, doing basic research for the NIH, uh, and then he went on and went back to cl uh, clinical duties and did his uh, fellowship in cardiology at Georgetown and Johns Hopkins. Uh, following that, you can see in his career, he's gone from clinical training to basic science training to back and forth. So after uh, doing the cardiology fellowship, he uh, spent a year in the University College uh, and Cardiothoracic Institute at, in London, England, where he did basic science again. Uh, and so he has a rich history of, of blending the clinical and the basic science. Dr. Licata has authored over 400 original publications, as well as 200 invited reviews and book chapters, so he knows how to write a manuscript. Uh, he's delivered over 300 invited lectures, and I understand that if we just told him on the blink of an eye to give a 30-minute lecture, he could do it without slides. And so that's quite an accomplishment. He's won numerous awards, including the Allied Signal Achievement Award in Aging, the Novartis Prize in Gerontology, the Irving Wright Award of Distinction from the American Federation of Aging Research, and has also been given the Distinguished Leader Award from the International Society of Heart Research. And so he's really blended aging and cardiovascular uh, research, which is not something that's common at all. Usually, we stick on one side of the fence or the other. Uh, in addition, he's also been elected into the American Society for Clinical Research, the Association of American Physicians, and has been elected as a fellow for both the American Physiological Society, the cardiovascular section, as well as several sections in the American Heart Association. And so it's my privilege today to introduce him to him. Uh, he's going to tell us about the stress of aging, uh, something we probably don't know too much about, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Licata, thank you. Um, there's a little bit of everything, as I was telling the group at lunch in this presentation. It ranges from demography, epidemiology, philosophy, cell biology, biophysics, pharmacology, genetics, etc. I hope that each of you find something that you like uh, in it. <clears throat> Uh, parts of this in the beginning, it's uh, sort of philosophical and it's kind of scary. So some of you may wish to close your eyes uh, from time to time. <laughs> At least I know you're alive. <laughs> so reality emerges from a mutually coupled enslaved system of DNA and its environment. And I know you think that I'm a bit crazy if that's all there is to reality. Wait till you see what the environment entails. <laughs> There's the DNA, <clears throat> uh, the nuclear environment, the cytosolic environment. As cell biologists, you know lots about that. The extracellular environment, organs within our bodies talking to each other through nerves or blood. Organisms. We have a soma and a psyche, and we have a personality, and we can think, and we have secret thoughts. And we have different lifestyles of nutrition and exercise, etc. Other organisms like bugs and plants and relatives and colleagues. <laughs> Society, religion, regulation, mandates, tradition. Think about what it would be like trying to sit here without gravity. <clears throat> And of course, our cosmic connection and the uh, Russians beat us there. <laughs> now, I call this a, a, a mutually enslaved system for the following reason. There's continuous signaling going on across these interfaces. Of course, it's hard for me to demonstrate the cosmic uh, uh, signaling, but well, 
you could think of start with the tides and work your way down. And we don't usually think about all of this. But just to keep you sitting here in the basal state, this signaling has to be going on pretty much uh, uh, in a normal way. So with aging, this system loses its robustness and flexibility. We have energy rundown. Our phenotype changes uh, from cells, tissues, organs, and organisms. And we get probably the highest energy we have is here at the time of fertilization. And then it all runs downhill, although we don't sense it here because other people are putting in energy on our behalf and society. So we could categorize the things that happen with aging as failing interactions, the signals change, the sensing of signals, the transmission of signals, the response to signals, proteostasis, molecules dancing in the dark within our cells, very, very important. They keep bumping into each other, I think, uh, as we get older. And of course, energy rundown that I mentioned. Now, the, there's this concept of aging as borrowed time. So sometimes we think that uh, we in the biomedical arena have done great things by extending lifespan. You see, this is life expectancy. Uh, up until about this time, it was uh, increasing because of declining early and midlife mortality. Past this time, we've added years to the end of life. But, but one wonders if we only have done the job half well because of what else happens once we get past a certain age or the likelihood for things to happen then the failures ultimately. <laughs> okay, so in other words, aging is a shift in our reality. But, but wait, there's more. The demographic imperative. In 2002, the areas in pink that you see had 20, over 20% 20 of the population uh, over the age of 60. But that was in the past, and we need to think not only of the present, but what's going to be, what's the future hold in store for us? Imagine in 2050, some of you will still be here then. Looks like a lot of you will be here. <laughs> Here's what's in store. The world is going to be pink. The world is not equipped for the societal change of this sort, certainly not in the biomedical community. And I'll try to address this uh, as, as the, uh, towards the end of my, uh, my talk. So as our life expectancy increases, we need a systematic approach to ensure that we have a healthy old age. <clears throat> What we need to do is define those failures that I talked about, and we need to integrate the information that we learn about them. So I'm going to be talking about the cardiovascular system today, uh, just about the arterial system. <clears throat> and in our laboratory, we've brought together scientists from diverse backgrounds in mathematics, physics, biology, psychology, etc. So we have a balanced approach, I think, of uh, integration and reduction uh, in our scientific approach. That's our laboratory <clears throat> in 2012. And now we're going to shift enough philosophy uh, now into what's happening, what's the reality of aging viewed from the arterial wall. I think I'm going to change the title for next time. But first, how do we study aging of the cardiovascular system? It's so risky for cardiovascular disease. This is the remaining lifetime risk for having cardiovascular disease if you're age 40 and you don't have any clinical diagnoses. More than 8 out of 10 will become hypertensive. CHD is chronic heart disease, coronary artery disease, you know, 1 out of 2 people. 
So now let's figure out, have we learned anything about aging in the absence of disease? So we can't, at least when there's frank disease, we can't mix that with aging. But later on, I'm going to make the, ask you a tougher question about is aging a disease and, and look what's happening in the arterial wall. But for now, uh, we do the best we can when we confront an organism, we try to separate out lifestyle issues from disease and aging, and each of those has a genetic component. Not too much is known about that now. What's left over after all these others becomes genetics, I mean aging. And this is a common list of what happens to the central arterial system. We're going to be focusing on the central arteries today. Uh, they dilate, there's a diffuse intimal medial thickening, I'll be showing you a lot of that. Increased collagen, the elastin becomes frayed, the arteries become stiffer, that increases the systolic and pulse pressure, uh, substantial endothelial dysfunction, and I'm gonna be dwelling on the inflammation that's occurring in our arteries as we speak. This is the uh, this is a Doppler ultrasound technique to measure uh, intimal medial thickening uh, non-invasively. I'll show you the data in humans. This is from a human specimen. This is the thickened intima. In humans, the intimal medial thickening is largely this intimal thickening. So you, so you don't see much here happening in the sample from the younger person. This is uh, actual data from the BLSA cross-sectional data in men and women showing the intimal medial thickness. This is not atherosclerosis, and it has nothing to do with plaques. They're, they're not included in these measurements. You note that it's not a linear function as I've drawn it. It's an exponential function. And note also the tremendous heterogeneity in older, among older persons. Some look like they're young. Some middle-aged persons look like they're old. This study took uh, about 15 years to do, so it's longitudinal. So repeated measures uh, in the same persons. And uh, uh, in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study, we have people who enter the study at different ages and leave at different ages. And when we want to look at their data all together to find out what's going on across the whole rage span, we make these spaghetti plots. And, and you probably can't tell from the resolution here, but the problem is worse than we thought because if we look at the slope of this line, so these are the average changes per decade, the slope increases with increasing each increasing decade. It's, it's like many other parameters that we've begun to measure, reductions in oxygen consumption, stiffness, et cetera. It's, it's much worse than we thought. Stiffness, uh, it's very easy to measure as pulse wave velocity. You put a probe if you want to measure the aortic pulse wave velocity on the carotid artery, the femoral artery, measure the distance between the two points and the time it takes to get from one point to the next, you have pulse wave velocity. This is pulse wave velocity in men and women of the Baltimore Longitudinal Study. Same profile, uh, not too much ch action before the age of 40, then uh, a lot of heterogeneity after that. This is the brachial artery pulse pressure, which is related to the central artery stiffening. It's been found through epidemiology studies that these measures here that you see on this list, these are independently associated with future cardiovascular events even when other known risk factors are uh, taken into account. So this is what we say changes with aging. In this way, what's happening to your arteries as you age is really a risk factor for future disease. We have a study in Sardinia that has 6,000 persons. We tried to give a, uh, I understand Dr. Ferrucci, who's my boss, was here recently. Uh, this is a cohort where we measure 100 phenotypes and uh, do genome-wide association uh, studies to try to link, to make associations uh, uh, with uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. This study is in a small, three small villages in Sardinia. It's a founder population. These cardiovascular parameters that we're interested in, you see here, they're all heritable. Doesn't mean that they're genetically transmitted, but they're heritable. The numbers on the top uh, are very uh, impressive in terms of heritability scores, H squared. Pulse wave velocity in Sardinia looks just like I showed you in the BLSA. 
And what we found uh, in one of our initial studies was that uh, this uh, SNP in the collagen type 4A gene was associated with stiffness. And in addition, in women who have uh, this allele pattern, uh, have, uh, this is cross-sectional data. We don't have the longitudinal part for that, excuse me. Uh, have a function of pulse wave velocity versus age that's statistically different from the other allele patterns. Now, let's go to the central artery wall itself. This is a little movie, and, and this is, if it works, we're going to, we're going to uh, uh, cone down from the adventitia to the media to the endothelial. That's the adventitia. Those are the smooth muscle cells. They're aligned like that. And that's the back wall of the artery. These vertically oriented things are endothelial cells. OK, now in our studies, we like to employ numerous species to determine whether what we're measuring is specific for a species or whether it occurs uh, in most of the species that we examine. Keep in mind that uh, when I show you the damage report card, that, that chronic inflammation is reporting the unabated DNA system failures that I told you about earlier. They're continuing to occur and generating inflammatory signals. So I said we would get back to inflammation. These are data from humans, monkeys, and rats. I told you about some of these things in humans. You see the green concordance means it happens in all of the species that are listed here. Uh, there are changes that occur in the matrix. And there are changes that occur in the smooth muscle cells. I'll be telling you about some of those things. And, and the rest of this pathway here, I won't be describing in detail, but some of them items I will. Uh, this is part of a pro-inflammatory phenotype. So these are endothelial cells from a young human specimen. From an old, you see the tremendous reorganization and shape changes of endothelial cells in humans as we age. This is the diffuse intimal thickening that I told you about earlier. Uh, I mentioned collagen uh, and fibronectin. This is arterial wall collagen type 1 and type 3. Human specimens from an older donor and a younger donor. Uh, when these, when this, in this thickened intima, cells well, let me not get ahead of myself. I'll, I'll, I'll spell it out for you. We'll get to the vascular smooth muscle cells. It's important to know at this point that, that when we talk about what's happening to cells and the, and the matrix within the arterial wall with aging, that it, it's not generalized. There are foci. There's heterogeneity among cells. And if Judy Campisi were here, which she was recently, she talks about subpopulations of cells that can broadcast this secretory, senescence-associated secretory signal, as, as she calls it. And this is her slide. Uh, so that you see not all the cells are, have to be affected, but a cell that's affected can secrete chemokines and affect uh, neighboring cells, the function, structure, and life of other cells. Uh, this is, uh, shows that, to our surprise, uh, with this inflammatory profile, we expected to see we, we expected to see senescent cells in the arterial wall, but there are very few cells that have senescent markers. They're more highly proliferative. Uh, this is the, how the cell cycle changes on the bottom uh, here: um, a reduction in uh, G1, GO, and an increase in G2M and S1 or S phase. Uh, this is Ki67, old and young, and PCNA. Uh, staining, and this is a proliferation assay. And similarly, uh, we like to study the invasive properties or the chemotactic properties. Here we, we put a, a, 
an artificial m membrane, matrigel, over this filter that has holes. And we give a chemoattractant gradient, and the cells migrate or chew their way through this uh, membrane and attach to the bottom side of the filter. We count the cells at the bottom side. When we take cells from the aorta of young rats, there's a phenomenon that occurs with increasing passage in culture. They learn how to become invasive. And they do this by being able to make matrix metalloprotease with increasing passage, MMP2. Old cells, cells from the old wall, are rare and to go as soon as we can make the measurement. All right, so I told you something about age-associated remodeling of the large arteries. Down the words are down the bottom. Talked about vascular smooth muscle cell proliferation invasion. And, and what have we learned on how that occurs? So to be invasive, the cells have to tear down their own, they have to change their phenotype, tear down their own basement membrane and chew their way through the matrix. In, uh, in humans, we find an increase in matrix metalloprotease activity, um, both in vivo and in vitro in a non-FOS uh, technique, and also MMP9, shown here. This is an old sample from an older person. In most of those other models, we, we don't find MMP9. It's more of an acute uh, issue. Um, but we find MMP2. This is a non fos in situ zymogram. This doesn't discriminate between uh, different types of uh, MMP activity, but you see the old versus the young by this fluorescence, and the uh, anti MMP blocks it, and this is the average data. Okay, so what we think happens is that these cells, we measure the, the translation. Whoops. Transcription, translation, activity of MMP2 in the arterial wall with aging, and all of these factors that feed into MMP2 activity change with age. And that allows the cells to be invasive, we think. But also, these, these proteases activate latent growth factors that live in the matrix. And in particular, we studied TGF beta. And the active T, the, all of these molecules that you see here are increased with aging. And, and the MMP2 is required to uh, break down the precursor into the active TGF beta that uh, activates the receptor. Uh, we've been working, uh, we, so this is a highly inflammatory molecule, MCP1. And uh, it's in a, a signaling loop here with MMP2 and TGF beta. And more recently, we've studied calpane. And calpane activity increases uh, with the amount and activity increase with age. And this is absolutely necessary to, for MMP2 to be produced and active. And, and as you'll see earlier, this cal later on a slide, this calpane, there may be an error. I don't think I have them all connected. It's, it's involved in this pathways, the system in uh, microcalcification within the arterial wall. This is the MCP1 in the human sample here, young, the brown staining, old. You see the, this chemoattractant, there's a gradient across the arterial wall. This is the uh, average gradient that you see here. And we found that uh, MCP1 and TGF beta are, when we look at their immunolabeling and do a merge uh, staining, they're, they're, they're living close to each other. <clears throat> so the next part gets us to local angiotensin II signaling. Despite what you've learned about in the circulation, the local renin angiotensin system in the arterial wall is turned on in a big way with aging. This is angiotensin II, young and old. This is the AT1 receptor. This is the converting enzyme for angiotensinogen. To, and angiotensinogen levels are increased as well, not shown here. Now, a lot of these things I talked about here, and I said they're under the, uh, under the auspices of angiotensin II signaling. You'll see that there are other receptors involved in a minute. This pro-inflammatory, uh, there are issues that relate to uh, nitric oxide, reduced nitric oxide bioavailability. Um, they're not, this 
inflammatory profile is, is not uh, perpetrated by professional inflammatory cells, white blood cells. It's caused by endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells that change their nature uh, when they get older. The smooth muscle cells become less contractile and more secretory and proliferative, and they secrete these chemokines that, 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 that are measured here and on the other slide. Now, I promised that there'd be some other receptors. Endothelin-1 is very much linked to angiotensin signaling aldosterone. Uh, receptor for advanced glycation end products is something that we're working on now. And a lot of these uh, factors interact with each other, and in doing so, uh, have a role in matrix remodeling. Um, this is calcification, but I could hardly read it in this green color. I'll have to change that. But you could probably take a map like this and, and go all around the room and all the rooms up and down the corridor, and everything is linked. There are other signaling pathways that are linked, and it's a balance of all of this signaling, and it's the change in the balance over many years is what we're talking about. You can't, many people do aging research in, in cells, and they make cells become senescent in 24 or 48 hours. This is not that, I don't think. It's, it just can't be that simple. This is a very interesting molecule, milk fat globule E8 protein. Anybody hear of that? We found in a proteomics discovery survey that this increases with aging in the rats. Then we showed that it increases in monkeys and humans. It's a molecule that looks like this. Its receptor is alpha V beta 3. These are EGF-like motifs. That's the, for part of the name, it was discovered in milk fat. And it was originally found to be important in being a negotiation between apoptotic breast cells and macrophages. But since then, there have been a lot of other functions uh, found. And these are some of the major functions that it has in the uh, arterial wall. So one of the things that it does is it can drive um, chemotaxis or invasion of smooth muscle cells. And if it's knocked down here, uh, that effect of MFGE8, uh, uh, the effect of PDGF is lost. This chemoattractant, you see the age effect. And when the MFGE8 is knocked down, uh, MFGE8 activates the uh, ERK and, and activates, so this is phospho ERK here, and young and old uh, here. And this is as a function of MFGE8. Uh, MFGE8 has an effect on proliferation. This is a proliferation assay as a function of MFG, uh, another type of assay we don't have to consider now. Now, this is where it becomes interesting. Because if we knock down MFGE8, these are in vascular smooth muscle cells, early, early passage that still retain the properties they had in the arterial wall, what we do is, as you see here, we turn on these molecules like ATM, P53, and P21. And if we use this marker that Judy Campisi discovered, this form of beta-gal, uh, we see uh, the impact of silencing uh, MFGE8 on cells that stain for this senescent marker. So earlier when I said all of the cells aren't senescent, there are some cells that do stain for this. And when MFGE8 is knocked down, more cells give these senescent markers. And to me, one of the explanations could be that these cells don't want to become senescent. They don't give up that easy. Things like MFGE8 come along, and they want to drive uh, the system the other way to try to force the cells into the cell cycle, as MFGE8 does, and to, pre and to reduce the likelihood of becoming senescent. And then over long periods of time, other factors change in the balance. 
So there it is there. You have a stimulation of the cell cycle. And if you block uh, MFGE8 signaling, you uh, have these cell, these senescent markers and withdrawal from the cell cycle. MFGE8 is used a very big way in the cancer biology because it, uh, if you block MFGE8 or block its receptor, you block angiogenesis and you kill tumor cells that way, or tumor cells within tumors. Now, I think I put this here just to remind us that there are other players when we talk about fibrosis and remodeling. One very new development is that the signaling through the sodium potassium pump seems to be more important than just regulating sodium and potassium in cells. It's connected to signaling pathways that stimulate fibrosis. And you'll be hearing a lot more about that uh, in, in the future. Now, if we treat young animals with mini pumps for a month with angiotensin II, uh, we make their arteries look old. This is the young untreated. This is the old untreated. This is a, a low dose and a higher dose angiotensin II. There are lots of studies in the literature going the other way, showing that ACE uh, AT1 receptor inhibition or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibition uh, reduces parts of this inflammatory profile. And guess what? For those of you who don't give a hoot about angiotensin signaling or inflammation, angiotensin II signaling is very much linked uh, to SIRT1 and caloric restriction. Uh, inhibiting angiotensin II signaling retards different manifestations of aging. It looks very similar to caloric restriction. It has substantial effect on PPARs and the sirtuins. This is a very interesting article that ties all this together if you're interested in these sorts of issues. Okay. So we have this, uh, we didn't want to do what Judy Campisi did and say it's a SASP. We said it's an ASP. <laughs> age-associated arterial secretory phenotype. And I've given you, hopefully, some convincing evidence that this system is involved in it. Now, what if the ASP and the profile of pathophysiology, quintessential diseases that occur in arteries with aging, hypertension and atherosclerosis, has something in common? Well, the cellular and molecular profiles of the risky aspects of arterial aging are the same ones that have been implicated in those diseases. So this is the aging part. You've seen the first three columns. I've thrown in data from another laboratory in rabbits. Experimental hypertension in younger animals. Experimental atherosclerosis in younger animals. This is the early stage before the, you know, the big lipid infiltration. And ANG2 signaling. <laughs> to think that in medical school we only learned about that ANG2 was a vasoconstrictor. <laughs> now, to, to, to move from what I've told you into Interventions that may or may not work. There are a number of interventions that have shown promise with respect to some of the markers uh, and even to lifespan uh, issues with aging, uh, exercise, reduce sodium chloride intake, reduce caloric intake. Dr. Mazarow was a pioneer in that area. Resveratrol, which I'm going to show you next. These drugs that I mentioned, ACE inhibitors and ARB statins, uh, novel drugs like crosslink breakers. I didn't mention the non-enzymatic crosslink that occurs in many uh, proteins with aging, including growth factors or collagen to make the collagen even stiffer. But first, I'm going to tell you about inhibition of matrix metalloprotease. I thought this would be good to stick in for down here. So it's this area that we're going to try to attack. And unfortunately, we don't have a specific MMP inhibitor, but we use this Park Davis compound. 
and we treated rats for eight months between 16 and 24 months of age. And I wanted to just summarize the results without showing you all of them. What we did is we didn't change the expression of the of MMPs. We did a, a panel for most of the important ones as we know them, uh, but we changed their activity. <coughs> the activity was reduced. Um, we had a, a reduction, but it was not so striking in the intimal medial thickening. We markedly reduced this pro-inflammatory factor and TGF beta and its receptor signaling and the fibronectin and the fibrosis that relates from that. Uh, this was one of the most dramatic effects. The elastin, uh, MMP2 is a gelatinase as, as, uh, as well. It's, it, it, it has as a substrate uh, elastin, if you will. It binds to elastic fibers. And, and uh, the fragmentation was markedly reduced. And on the next slide, this is in this. These are brown Norway Fisher 344 uh, hybrids, and this is systolic and diastolic pressure. And you see, with age, over this age range in this strain of rats, systolic pressure goes up modestly. Uh, but MMP2, so it started here, and after about two months, uh, the blood pressure doesn't increase anymore. There are no no differences in mortality here with placebo or control. The lifestyle that we have, like the diet quantity and its composition, uh, I don't think too many people smoke anymore. The lack of physical conditioning create an additional stress imposed by aging itself. And that accelerates this chronic inflammation uh, and pushes the aging heart and arteries over the edge. Then they have a disease that becomes clinically manifest. So we used to try to separate age, disease, and lifestyle. Nathan Schock taught me that, and environment. That's reality. It's those interactions which are so hard to study. So a mandate to future biomedical researchers and healthcare physicians to prevent the epidemic of cardiovascular diseases that you saw uh, by retarding cardiovascular aging. And now the last part of the take home message, do the math. The demographic imperative I showed you, we will be living in an age society. <coughs> On borrowed time. So these larger numbers of older people will require more health care. Can't, we, don't, we can't do it. The likelihood of the older persons having cardiovascular disease is very high. He, he didn't say that. I said it. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. <laughs>